that brings us on to our last speaker for this evening, who's someone that I have been so, so excited about seeing. Uh, Max Weisel is a creative coder, really someone uh, after my own heart, an incredible digital artist. His work has been featured in all sorts of incredible museums around the world, including uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He's collaborated with Björk, he's collaborated with Lady Gaga, um, and his research and development company, Relative Wave, was bought by Google last year, which is some kind of a sign on uh, just really sort of how uh, transgressive and how exciting his work is. Um, he is the coolest software engineer that you're ever going to hear, um, and what pumps his heart are interfaces. So without further ado, uh, please welcome to the stage, Max. My name is Max, and I'm, I live and work in San Francisco, California. And today I'm going to talk about something that I spend almost every day thinking about, um, and that's interfaces. So there's this kind of pattern that I see in almost every interface um, that I've come across. Every interface starts out with like an experimental technology, something that is kind of new and unproven. And as we iterate on it, we slowly kind of build up you know, how it's going to work, and we build upon what we know about this interface. And it sort of grows exponentially, but eventually it kind of peaks. The only way to really move forward, the only way to create something better, is to start over. And uh, you know, we start over with a new interface in the hopes that where it ends up will be better than where we were before. But the kind of biggest issue with this is this gap here. This gap is the point where we're transitioning from one type of interface to another. And it's kind of the process of banging our heads against the wall as we try and figure out you know, what this new interface is going to be. I mean, this scares people. A lot of people, I think, really only kind of see the bottom of this curve. They don't really see where it could go. And, uh, and it makes sense. Traditionally, we never, had to, we never had to experience this. It's only with the invention of computers do we see the way we interact with the world changing potentially multiple times in our lifetime. Traditionally, the way we would interact with objects in our physical environment you know, never changed. Um, and so it, it kind of makes sense that people aren't really used to this. So it's worth overcoming this gap in an effort to get somewhere that's better. And if you understand this concept, you'll understand just about everything I'm about to talk about today. I first noticed this pattern in my own work. When I was a kid, I, I played a lot with music. You know, my rap career didn't really pan out. <laughs> and so I did the next best thing, which was, of course, to become a programmer. And <laughs> I spent a lot of time building these music and graphic sort of toys and applications. Um, and it was a hobby of mine for a while until um, just as I was finishing up high school, I woke up to this comment on my, on my WordPress blog. And it read, hi, I work for the recording artist Bjork. She's working on an iPad app based on a music program she has developed for the recording of her new album. And I would like to contact Max Weisel. Is it possible to get his contact details? So I did what anyone would do when they read this email, and, uh, and I laughed it off. I didn't think Bjork was trying to reach out to me. Um, especially, you know, and even if she was, I didn't think she'd do it by having somebody post a comment on a WordPress blog. But I found an email address, and, uh, and from there found a phone number, and called it up, and it turned out it was legitimate. And over the next year and a half, um, I worked with her to create Bjork Biophilia, which is an app album that we created in collaboration with a few others and her longtime designers, Eminem Paris. So Bjork Biophilia is the world's first app album, and it's this audio-visual experience to kind of bring you into the same place um, that the music brings you. And there are three apps that I want to show you today from this, uh, from this kind of mega app. And, uh, and they all share this quality that they're unique musical instruments. 
I mean, the first one is for the song Moon. So Moon was about the tarot card, the moon. Um, and the tarot card, the moon, is about kind of the state of feeling possessed by one's shadow um, or feeling slightly melancholic. And Bjork works to kind of bring this theme together of the moon having these cycles and its influence on everything from the tides to the fluid in our spines. And so I wanted to take all of those themes and put them into this unique uh, instrument. And so this is what the instrument looks like. Um, you have a moon at the top that pulls fluid up through the spine and washes them over these pearls. I'm playing each one as a note. And this is also designed around how the structure of this song is composed. And you can use this instrument to play her song um, without any modifications. And so, the, thanks. Um, the next app I want to show you is, is the app for the song Solstice. And so the song Solstice um, operates at the scale of kind of a solar system. Um, every song on this album operated at a different scale. Um, there were songs about everything from the size of a virus to um, the entire universe. And for Solstice, um, there were really two themes. Um, one, the solar system, and two, this was really meant to be a Christmas carol. So with this instrument, I wanted to create um, something that embodied both of these themes. So the way this works is there's a sun in the middle of the screen. And you pull out these rays of light that function as harp strings. And then you play it by flicking a planet in a motion. this can be used to play the song Solstice. Now, keeping in line with the Christmas theme, the entire solar system transitions into a Christmas tree. The sun becoming the star at the top. Thank you. Um, the planets becoming ornaments on the tree, and the stars turning into snow and uh, falling down. When The last app that I want to show today is for the song Dark Matter. Now, Dark Matter is interesting in that it, um, it started off as a song called Numa, and it was a song about the breath and the atmosphere's role in creating sound around us. Um, it's something we don't really see, but is responsible for almost everything that we hear. And Bjork draws this parallel between this and Dark Matter, something else that is unobservable in the universe but has this profound impact. And what was interesting about this app is that, or sorry, this song, is that it has no musical key. And so I've kind of faced this challenge of creating an instrument that um, wasn't really locked to a key, but would also show you the relationships between the various combinations of notes you were playing and the keys that they belong to. And so what we ended up creating was this audiovisual experience to go with the album. Um, and I'm really proud that just about a little over a year ago, this was acquired by the New York Museum of Modern Art and was the first app um, ever added to the permanent collection. So it's interesting, you know, only in retrospect that I kind of start to see 
this sort of cycle with interfaces happening. Uh, we were moving from you know, physical albums, this form that was very mature, it's very saturated, uh, to this kind of app album. It's like a digital album, and it's really us trying to blend the two interfaces. We're taking something we know and that's familiar and, and an exciting new technology and trying to blend it. And of course, this didn't become the way that you know, we all consume digital music, but it was a necessary kind of first pass to get there. But just as, uh, just as I was finishing up these apps, you know, I, was, I finally had some time to go outside, get my social life back, you know, see the sun. And uh, when I received another email, Bjork was working on a lot more than an album at the time. Um, she was working on a live tour, an education program, and a documentary. And I was basically being asked to move from collaborating on the apps um, to collaborating on everything. No pressure. <laughs> and of course, I couldn't say no. So this is a custom instrument Bjork had made for the album. It's a combination of a gamelan and a celeste. And the front of it has this kind of piano interface, but it's almost entirely computer controlled because the compositions it plays are um, too complex for a person to play. Uh, this was one of the other instruments that she had built, uh, which was a musical Tesla coil. And uh, this was also played by a computer, but not really because the compositions it would play were complex, but because there, there is no interface for this. Like, this is only played by a computer. So when going on the tour, I wanted to make interfaces for these instruments that would allow me to improvise and kind of bring this slightly more human feel to them. Um, so I started with a collection of iPads and worked to sync up timing, then to sync up visuals. I worked with my friend Charles from the Exploratorium, which is a museum in San Francisco, to build these modular cases. And these actually let me reposition the iPads with each song. And with this strong foundation, I started working on interfaces for these instruments. Um, this is a small demo after I had just gotten it working with Ableton Live. Same clip out of Ableton. We have nice visuals. And this is what the final product looked like. Um, I'm going to show you two interfaces now, which um, the first is a simple interface for controlling the test, the coil for the song, possibly, maybe. And the second um, is an interface for playing stems from the song Mouse Cradle. I mean, you'll notice the interfaces for these are, are fairly simple. Um, they're designed to only give me what I need to play that song at that particular moment. I actually got to play these on the tour. It was kind of fun to you know, go to after parties and have somebody be like, oh, so wh what instrument do you play? I'd be like, oh, I play you know, the iPads and Tesla coil. <laughs> but so this was kind of really the first pass that I ever did at creating like, a, an electronic instrument. Um, and it really started kind of this thought process about thinking about what digital instruments could be. Um, so I started looking at physical instruments, uh, something that was familiar, something that's very mature. And what I found is that the interfaces for electronic, in or sorry, for physical instruments aren't really defined to be the ideal interface for producing music. They're really the ideal interface for strings to produce sound. Um, the distance between frets on a guitar isn't dictated by you know, the ideal positions for your fingers. It's, it's dictated by how, like, the science of how a string produces sound. Um, and so, when it comes to electronic instruments, I kind of wanted to jump this gap um, and start fresh. And instead of mimicking this kind of saturated world of physical instruments, um, I was kind of starting over. 
And the idea here is really to forget about the way physical instruments work in an effort to ideally make digital instruments and get them to a point where they could potentially be more expressive than what we see with physical instruments. But I was starting at the very bottom of this curve. And so the first app that I made uh, is something I made in collaboration with James Mary, one of, one of Bjork's collaborators. And, and it's kind of my first pass at making a digital instrument. So you start by programming in the phrase that you want to play. I've already got one programmed in here. And then you play this app like a pendulum. What I love about this instrument um, is although it's an electronic instrument, it still sounds very human when it's played. And it's because I'm playing it like a real instrument. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think of electronic instruments and electronic music, they think of things being really stuck to a grid. And, uh, and I love that this doesn't sound like that. But with, similar to how the Bjork Tor apps worked, this is great for performance, but it's not really great for composition. And so, with the next project, I kind of set out to figure out, well, you know, what does the ideal interface look like to compose music electronically? Um, and when we look at the controllers that exist today, um, they're kind of crippled by the fact that there are no limitations. Like, you just see these grids of sliders and knobs and pads, and they, they don't really form any strong opinions about the type of music you're going to play or any sort of playing style. And so, with this project, um, I wanted to figure out, well, what is, you know, what is the ideal interface for, excuse me, for using an electronic instrument? And I started with a large touchscreen. But I quickly found there is no ideal interface for an electronic instrument. The ideal interface is one that you create yourself. Um, every electronic interface is different. And as you're working on it and figuring out how it's going to sound, um, you want to be shaping the interface as well. And so this project, which is called Whiteboard Music, allows you to draw the interface for your instrument. Um, different shapes of play notes or allow you to change um, the timbre of the, of the instrument. And I want to show you a demo of it. So here I'm drawing the interface for like a dubstep growl synthesizer. Um, this is a style made famous by Skrillex. And I'm just drawing a simple interface just to kind of illustrate the concept. Of, I have different controls for things like the mouth shape and the, or the vowel sound and the pitch. Um, and other controls that let me adjust the timbre. And once I've drawn out the interface and wired it up, I can play it. And as I work on this instrument, <laughs> thank you. So as I work on this instrument, I can go in and extend the interface. Um, here I'm drawing an interface for a low-pass filter. Um, it's just kind of funny to illustrate how it works.
Thank you. So, you know, this is still a very early path on figuring out what the future of digital instruments looks like. But with all new interfaces, while it's less polished and less mature, people are still going to be scared of this jump. They're moving from thinking about, you know, physical instruments, things that haven't changed in a while, um, things that are proven, that people spend their entire lives mastering. Um, it, they're kind of, I can see why they're skeptical of, of moving to this new interface until it's proven. Um, but this isn't something that just happens with music. It's something that happens um, with all interfaces. And the example I like to use is the internet. So there was this article written in 1995 by Clifford Stoll <clears throat> called Why the Web Won't Be Nirvana. And for those of you who don't know, Clifford Stoll is an astronomer who, in the mid-'80s, like, caught a hacker recruited by the KGB who was trying to break military security. Like, this guy is no noob as far as the Internet is concerned. And in 1995, just as the Internet was becoming commercialized, he wrote this piece about why it's not really going to be that great. And he goes on to say, after two decades online, I'm perplexed. It's not that I haven't had a gas of a good time on the internet. I've met great people and even caught a hacker or two. But today I'm uneasy about this most trendy and oversold community. Visionaries see a future of telecommuting workers, interactive libraries and multimedia classrooms. They speak of electronic town meetings and virtual communities. Commerce and business will shift from offices and malls to networks and modems. And the freedom of digital networks will make government more democratic. Baloney. Do our computer pundits lack all common sense? The truth is, no online database will replace your daily newspaper. No CD-ROM can take the place of a competent teacher, and no computer network will change the way government works. We're promised instant catalog shopping, just point and click for great deals. We'll order airline tickets over the network and make restaurant reservations. We'll negotiate sales contracts, and stores will become obsolete. So how come my local mall does more business in an afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? Even if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism, salespeople. So first, I love that it's 2015, and I'm reading this article on the internet. But it's interesting to look at why does he feel this way? Well, he goes on to say, you know, what's missing from this electronic wonderland? Human contact. Discount the fawning techno burble about virtual communities. Computers and networks isolate us from one another. A network chat line is a limp substitute for meeting friends over coffee, and no interactive multimedia display comes close to the excitement of a live concert. Who would prefer cybersex to the real thing? While the internet beckons brightly, seductively flashing an icon of knowledge's power, this non-place lures us to surrender our time on Earth. A poor substitute it is, this virtual reality where frustration is legion and where in the holy names of education and progress, important aspects of human interactions are relentlessly devalued. So he kind of thinks the internet isn't really going to be all that big at the time because it's a poor substitute for reality. Um, he's kind of standing at the top of this first hill here, you know, used to his way of life with shopping malls and travel agents, and he's looking down at this unproven, and, uh, this unproven technology that, that needs iteration, and he's unable to really see where it's going to go. Um, but I don't blame him. Like, this, is, this is not an intuitive leap. Uh, you know, we're always going to kind of use what we know now to try and predict the future, and it's, it's always going to create something that sounds worse. Um, and I'd even go as far to say that, um, tr like, Truly new interfaces are not intuitive. Um, just by definition, if an interface is truly new, then it presents a new way of doing things. And if something is intuitive, it's, it's something we understand based on the way we do things now or the way we've done things previously. Um, but to use a more recent example, let's look at something that I hope is familiar, um, the iPhone. So the iPhone was introduced in 2007, and it brought us this beautiful direct manipulation interface. Um, but it wasn't intuitive. Um, when this was first introduced, no one even knew how it was going to scroll. And I can see a lot of people might be a little skeptical of that, but let's take a look. I'm an artist right now. Well, how do I scroll through my list of artists? How do I do this? I just take my finger and I scroll. That's it. Mm. 
isn't that cool? A little rubber banding up when I run off the edge. Steve Jobs is at Moscone Center in San Francisco. He's in front of 4,000 people, and no one knew how that was going to scroll. Like, it would have been ridiculous at the time to imagine how this was going to permeate our lives. Um, and this interface went on to be adopted by all modern smartphones, and it changed everything. Um, at least for me, it, it changed how I get to work, it changed how I eat, my relationship with my family. And this new interface presents a new way of doing things. Uh, you know, again, if, if we couldn't predict how this was going to scroll, it's, it's, you have to imagine it's impossible to, to think about how this is going to permeate our lives. Um, but so why does this feel so good? Why does, in retrospect, why does this feel so intuitive? Uh, well, it's because this interface takes advantage of our perceptual and motor skills. Um, these are skills that we developed far before we learned things like how to read or write, or how to speak. And it's also the way that we work with the physical world. Just about everything we interface with besides a computer uh, doesn't really involve language like this. Um, you know, even holding something as simple as a glass of water, I know the material of the glass and how hard to hold it. I know how full it is and the viscosity of the liquid. I know whether it's going to spill. I even know the temperature and whether I'm going to burn myself. I mean, that's before I even look at it. Um, to use another example, even you know, when I'm holding a pencil, I have a really, my brain has a really good idea of where the tip of it is. Um, I know how hard I need to press to create certain thicknesses of lines. Um, I might even know how many pages I have left in my notebook just based on how it feels against my hand. And so when we look at the physical world, you know, this doesn't really seem ideal. We don't get anywhere near as much information from this. And it's starting to make me think that 2D interfaces might be limiting us. Um, our brain is so used to this physical 3D world that we interact with everywhere else that we have to kind of work to shape it into these 2D metaphors. And you know, we've made almost every software interface in the book. I mean, truly new 2D interfaces require us to reach for those higher level skills like language. Um, and so when I look at the cycle, 2D interfaces are here. They're very mature. But as we've seen with how we interact with just you know, regular objects, there's something that's much better. And I believe that something is going to be 3D interfaces. So I've recently become interested in virtual reality. Um, when I first tried it, I didn't really think much of it. Like Clifford Stoll, I, I kind of just thought it was gimmicky, and I didn't see how it was going to change the world. And then I tried a different headset that was, that was really good. Um, I was doing the simulation where I was standing in a room, just as sure of the ground beneath me as you are of the chair beneath you right now, when the entire world transitioned to space. And I was floating in space. And that sounds really cool, right? Like you're standing in a room, and all of a sudden you're flying through space. But it was actually terrifying. Um, this was so good that the reptilian part of my brain kicked in, and I thought I was going to fall to my death. And it really makes me think this could be the key to making 3D interfaces. Um, and 3D interfaces that uh, permeate our lives in the same way the internet and mobile devices have. Um, 3D interfaces that feel as intuitive as the iPhone. And I get a sense that this isn't a popular opinion, but I think the reason for that is a lot of people are using what they know from 2D interfaces and what they know from reality in an effort to imagine what the future of virtual reality looks like. And just as you know, we shouldn't borrow from physical instruments to make digital instruments, because we'll always make something worse, and in the same way that we can't look at our local shopping mall to predict Amazon or uh, you know, our travel agent to, book, to predict how we're going to book airline tickets online, um, we can't do the same thing here. And when we overcome that leap, when we stop thinking about what we know in an effort to create 3D interfaces, it becomes really interesting to think of how we're going to do different things in VR. You know, I don't have any answers to these questions, but it becomes really interesting to think about, you know, how are we going to get the news in VR? Um, how are we going to study the world? How are we going to exercise or experience art? How are we going to adventure in VR? How is VR going to help us overcome our fears? Or potentially even help us find love and build relationships? <laughs> so, I can't stress this enough. The new is never going to be a copy of the old. This is something I think 
that has the potential in a decade or so to be as big as the internet or mobile devices. Um, but in all seriousness, I want to show you two examples of something I think VR really enables. And the first um, is a product from two friends of mine, Drew and Patrick, who are the creators of Tilt Brush. So I'd like to show you a video from the future of storytelling about Glenn Keane. Um, Glenn Keane is a Disney animator known for his work on animated films such as The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and many more. Uh, and this is a video of Glenn Keane using Tilt Brush in VR. Today, all the rules have changed. By putting tools in your hand that can create in virtual reality, I can put goggles on and I just step into the paper and now I'm drawing in it. North, south, east, west, all directions are open now. Just immersing myself in space is more like a dance. What is this amazing new world I just stepped into? When I draw in virtual reality, I draw all the characters real life size. They are that size in my imagination. The character can turn. Ariel is actually turning in space. And even if you take the goggles off, I'm still remembering she's right there. It's real. That doorway to the imagination is open a little wider. The edges of the paper are no longer there. This is not a flat drawing. This is sculptural drawing. Making art in three-dimensional space is an entirely new way of thinking for any artist. What does this mean for storytelling? I love the idea as an animator that you can be anything that you can imagine. And as a kid, you're completely free. The soul of any kind of a creative art form is the freedom. So, you know, I think it's very hard to imagine what these experiences kind of look like, and really the, the only way that I've found to be able to describe this is sort of like taking a tube of toothpaste um, in a world without gravity and just squeezing it into the air. Um, it's something that feels so natural, and it's something I don't think really anyone has ever experienced. Um, but the second demo that I want to show before I wrap things up is from Be Another Lab. So Be Another Lab creates the machine to be another, and essentially what this is, is two VR headsets um, with two cameras on them. And what this allows you to do is live vicariously through somebody else's perspective. Um, they have an experiment called the gender swap experiment that allows you to basically experience what it's like to live in the body of somebody else of the opposite gender. And I want to show you that here.
So this enables us to experience something I think very few people have ever experienced, um, and to do things that we never thought were possible. Um, in a decade, I really believe that 3D interfaces have the ability to permeate our lives, um, just as so many others have. Um, it's an area that will be ripe for innovation, um, but it's something we need to open our minds to. And there's a quote I really love from Doug Engelbart, who, who I consider to be the father of human-computer interaction. And it says, "We need to become better at being humans." Learning to use symbols and knowledge in new ways across groups, across cultures, is a powerful, valuable, and very human goal. And it is one that is obtainable if we only begin to open our minds to full, complete use of computers to augment our most human capabilities. So, just to recap, I think this gap here between an old interface and a new interface is always going to feel a little brutal. Um, we are moving from something that's very mature to something that, you know, needs time to mature. But it's something that is worth overcoming, because ideally, where we'll end up will be much better than where we were before. I mean, of course, the cycle will repeat. This is a cycle that I see in almost everything that I do. I'm surprised every time I go through it, and I don't think anyone is immune to it. The only way to push through. Is to know that something better is ahead, and it's worth keeping an open mind. So we'll always end up somewhere better than we were before. Thank you.